thoughts of my mind and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Thank you for reading those three readings. The things of the kingdom of God, the deep things of the kingdom of God, are just that. They are very deep. And deep things are often hidden from the human eye. Therefore, we need special insight to discern these deep, hidden things that are at the very heart of the kingdom of God. And here we have in our Old Testament reading the great prophet Samuel coming to, uh, to choose a king for Israel because Saul has, Saul's ministry has run into the sand. He's become more and more um, uneffective for God. He's become a more and more dysfunctional and proud king. And so Samuel the prophet starts to realize that Israel is going to need another king. And here he comes to Jesse. And uh, Jesse is well known to have a, a number of godly sons. And there, it's almost like choosing a vicar, isn't it? He's uh, looking, he's casting his eye, Prophet Samuel, over the sons of Jesse. And he's wondering which is the one that the Lord will choose, which is the one that the Lord will anoint to lead Israel forward. Now, when I was reflecting on this, uh, I couldn't help thinking of my friend, Roma friends who are Pentecostal leaders. There are lots and lots and lots of them all over Europe. And they, they um, take great pride in how shiny their shoes are. And occasionally, my, the unshininess of my shoes are pointed out to me. And uh, is, uh, sometimes they will make the mistake of, of measuring uh, the stature of a pastor by the shininess of his shoes. And some of them are taken to uh, buying patent leather shoes and cleaning them to the, uh, so they really sparkle like Roseanne's shoes do now. <laughs> um, as it becomes so beautifully, unforgettably clear from this reading from Samuel, um, the Lord isn't looking at the shininess of the shoes. He's not looking at the outward appearance. And uh, Samuel casts his eye o over all the um, impressive sons of Jesse and realizes that the Lord is saying, no, none of them are the right one for the job. And then he remembers, oh, yes, there is, the, there is a... Jesse points out to Samuel, there's a, there is another one. There is another son I've got. But he, he's only the shepherd boy. So Samuel says, well, uh, let's have him come along. We'll stay standing to honor him when he comes in. So David leaves his flocks and, and comes into the gathering where there's this uh, all, um, sacrificing themselves to the Lord. And um, he's described as being a very a handsome and rugged of, of great appearance. But I actually don't think it was that that impressed Samuel when he saw him. Samuel must have seen something in this little David's heart that was what was needed in a king of the future. He saw a king in the making. Now, Paul, when he's writing his epistles, quite often refers to uh, the super apostles. Uh, and he says, don't be led astray by the super apostles. You need to look for other qualities uh, than the shininess of the shoes, for example. And he refers in our reading, he talks about um, the super apostles whose pride is in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. And Samuel, going back to the Old Testament reading, Samuel chooses the youngest and probably the least likely, passing over all these uh, senior sons and choosing the shepherd boy. Jesus, in his ministry, clearly didn't go for the most highly educated or impressive uh, rabbis of the day to, 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 to form his little band of followers. He went, we can't say for the most humble, because not all of them were terribly humble, were they, at the beginning, but he went out for the lowliest of the men, 
in a way, people who you wouldn't normally naturally choose to be the people who you would build a church on. He went out to those, the fishermen, uh, those p humble, meek people, and he must have seen in them a uh, huge potential, not finished products. He saw the raw material, and I think he must have seen how they would become, ultimately, when they became full of the Spirit and had, th had three years of teaching from Jesus and had seen him die on the cross and rise again. He saw what these people like James and John and Peter would yet become. I think he saw, would have seen in them um, that they would have in them, in spite of their pride and roughness and you know, um, wet behind the earness, he would have seen a spirit of humility. He would have seen a teachable spirit, a spirit which is teachable, a, te a spirit that can actually learn something and move on. You've got an unteachable spirit in your classroom. They're never going to learn anything, are they? But a teachable spirit is open to learning, moving on. So true abiding deep growth, it appears, in the kingdom of God, is always hidden. And so that brings us nicely to our gospel reading, where we have a baffled farmer, a farmer who sows his seed and notices that amazingly, the Greek underlying word automatically, all by itself, sees the growth come. It doesn't all come at once, in a great hurry, there's the s nicely pointed out in the parable, there's the stalk, then the ear, and then the full grain. But this farmer is baffled because um, the growth is actually completely beyond his control. Whether it's day by day or by night, he recognizes that the, the growth, the really deep growth, continues unseen. If one were to stare at the seed that, seeds that have been planted, of course, you would see nothing happen. But if you had a look at it closely and then came back the next day or the next week or the next month, you might say, ah, something's been going along all the time. The deepest things of the kingdom are just that. They are deep. They are hidden. The kingdom of God is within you, said Jesus. And I think he meant that the kingdom is both within the heart of the believer, but also within you in the sense of within your group, your gathering. Within you as a group of people, the kingdom of God is in your midst or within you. And saints are made along the road. They are not People are not born saints. None of us are born saints. God is working in our lives all the time in deep places, in places that are hidden to the naked eye. Deep in the hearts of men and women, God is trying to create humble, teachable spirits who will work in partnership with the king to advance the king's kingdom. And God is working in a second way, then, in the heart of the community as a whole. God is, needs humble people who are, have malleable spirits, like soft clay, who are sufficiently malleable that he can create out of them saints who will work in partnership with him for the advance of his kingdom. And it seems that the deep, hidden secret of the kingdom here is that in order for this to happen, we have to let go of the control. We have to let go. We have to allow the master potter to mold us. Samuel, I think, must have spotted in the shepherd boy David a willingness to be molded, a willingness to be fashioned, 
The scripture tells us that he was a man after the heart of God rather than the man wanting power and fame. And of course, we know from the history of King David that the moment he went after power and fame and control, it led to disaster and he was brought back on his knees till God made his spirit a teachable spirit once again. But it is so hard for us, is it not, to let go of control and allow God to mold us into what he wants us to become. We want in ourselves, and probably much more quickly than in ourselves, in each other, the full product right away. We want in our church, in our gatherings, the full thing right away. But a humble, teachable spirit within the kingdom of God, it seems to me, is made in a completely different way to the way of the world. The seed, Jesus tells us in another place in the gospel, John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus Jesus tells us that the seed has to fall into the ground and die. Something in us has to die before we can grow and before the seed can bear fruit. Imagine the farmer in the gospel parable, again, from Mark. He plants the seed, the seeds, he plants the seed and the seed disappears into the earth. It goes into the soul. You might say all hope is gone. It's a kind of burial process as the seed goes into the earth. It's actually death. But if the farmer has sufficient patience, then days or weeks or months later, depending on the type of seed it is, the growth then comes. The first signs of growth begin to emerge out of what looked like, humanly speaking, death. A seed that has been buried in the ground. The miracle happens. The little shoot comes up. Resurrection comes. It's a long, long wait in the kingdom of God for some seeds to bear fruit. I know almost nothing about biology, but I know enough to know that You can plant some seeds in the ground and they spring up very quickly. Jesus talks about it in the parable, doesn't he? The weeds spring up like that. But I guess other kinds of seeds, maybe of sort of oak trees or African uh, ebony, ivory, African blackwood, for which clarinets are made, take centuries and centuries to grow into trees. So this process, with I guess with some of us, this process of dying and growing uh, in, takes is not a long time. But in others, others of us, it might take decades. It might take 60 years for you to see, oh my goodness, that's how he was when he was 10. But this is how he is now. Over that huge span, expanse of time, um, Jimmy shared yesterday what he was like as a teenager to the men at the men's breakfast. Graphically, it would be terrifying to go into a room with Jimmy when he was 13. (laughs) Absolutely terrifying. And by the time he was 17, he described himself as a a muscle-bound 16 stone of weight boxer. Is that right? 16 stone. Um... Not the kind of person you'd want to fall out with in a hurry. (laughs) But look at him now. Decades later, a man that went to Sierra Leone risking his life to build a a bread factory. (laughs) That's how long it took to make Jimmy as the man we love and know now. Sorry to embarrass you, Jimmy, but I need you to an example. <laughs> I couldn't see a better one around than that. I'm sure there are others hidden, hidden away, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody else. I'm tempted to do so. 
It's a long process to become a saint. And I mean the saint in the kind of traditional way, you know. <clears throat> Let's get back to Paul. Paul tells us in his reading we had this morning that some people will say, we are out of our minds, we Christians, out of our minds. You see, a true saint in the making may actually look a little bit unhinged. A true saint is unconformed to the pattern of this world. <coughs> to pick up what Paul says to the Romans. We are, if we are truly in the process of growing, if we are truly malleable spirits, teachable spirits, species of soft clay, we will be unconformed to the pattern of this world. Before I was going to be, uh, uh, went forward to try and become a vicar with the selection process, I said to my good friend Richard King, some of you know very well, I said to Richard, the problem with me is I'm just so eccentric, aren't I? People think I'm eccentric. And he said, Martin, yes, this is when I was about 37, he said, Martin, yes, you are very, very eccentric, but that's just the quality you will need if you're going to be uh, in, in ministry in the church. You need to be able to be eccentric. There are some ways in which you are unhelpfully eccentric. <laughs> he knew that because he lived with me and we shared a flat for long, many years. But there are other ways in which you are eccentric which God can use. We need to be unconformed to the pattern of this world. Paul goes on to t talk about how we all died. We all went through a death process. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for God. This is the ultimate test then. Samuel, in our Old Testament reading, Samuel saw in David the potential that this man would learn to put the kingdom of God before himself. When given the chance to put a spear through the heart of his rival, King Saul, uh, thereby saving his own life, you'll remember how he says, no, I cannot lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. He realizes, he, he, he has it within him, King David, the emerging King David, to realize that his, the values of the kingdom of God are much more important than his own life and his own self-preservation. So you see, the person who puts first... Paul tells us, the whole scripture tells us, the needs of the whole and the needs of others might look to the wider community like somebody who's out of their mind, unconformed, eccentric, a bit loopy. I think people who put the needs of others before themselves actually do rather often look a bit loopy, because we are actually rather rare. When I stop and think, how many people do I know who really, really don't care a hoot about themselves, but just live for others? There's not a big list immediately springs to mind, but there are some that do. Because such people, such loopy ones, unconformed ones, eccentric ones, are no longer marching to the drumbeat of this world. They are marching to another drumbeat. They are no longer living for themselves, but for him who died, Paul tells us, for them and was raised. They are no longer living for themselves, but for him who died. For him, Jesus, who became that seed who dropped into the ground and had to die before he could spring up again. Do you see? Let's think about this. Let's unpack this a bit deeper. Let's drill into this. Who no longer live for themselves. No longer live for themselves. This suggests, then, doesn't it, a two-stage process. Stage one, living for yourself. Stage two, living for others. Somewhere between stage one and stage two, a death process happens. Paul puts it like this, doesn't he, in one of his epistles. He says, I consider my old life and all the things I did, all my pedigree and everything else, I considered it pure dung. 
compared to what has now been revealed to me. Another place he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Another place he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but he lives in me. So between stage one, living for yourself, and stage two, living for others, this death process, this death point needs to happen, it seems to me. Now the wonder of this is this, I think. This sounds terrifying, doesn't it? At a human level, it sounds completely terrifying, completely insane that you have to die completely to yourself. But actually, you know what? It's such a beautiful place to come to. It's such a beautiful place to come to. Because when we come to the place that we are only living for others, we have become actually indestructible. Indestructible. Having died already, nobody can get you anymore. Nobody can get you anymore. I don't think I've got there yet, but I do know that I've come a bit of the way along the journey. Because I remember many years in the music business, when before the, the show, the concert, I will be conscious of who's coming to listen. And there were certain people when they came to listen, where well, fear would enter me. Because I knew they didn't think much of me and my playing. So I would play actually rather worse than I was capable of playing. When people came along, like my friend Richard, and came to the show, and he was sitting at the back, smiling, all of a sudden I noticed that my confidence went up hugely, and I play a whole lot better, maybe even better than I thought I was capable of. And I go home thinking, what is going on here? This is ridiculous. I'm completely victim to the, what people are thinking of me out there. If I've got a fan club, take on the whole world. I've got enemies, crumble. Of course, it gets rather worse in an orchestra. It must be the same in a football team. But you, you then get conscious of your colleagues. What do your colleagues think of you around there? And then the whole, you get this whole atmosphere of, of, of a mixture in, of either pride or fear. Pride and fear, pride and fear in the whole group. And Jesus invited me into another place, and I thought I would never, ever taste this. A place where it really doesn't matter anymore what anybody thinks of you. <laughs> because you've already died. And in a way, that's what happened to me before I came to Luton. It happened to me in Cranbrook, where I tried so hard to be successful. <laughs> tried so hard to be a, a good vicar and do lots of wonderful things and got lots of pats on the back. But it all ran into the sand totally totally ran into the sand, so I had to leave. I was told it would be better if I left. And at, at that point, um, now looking back six years, that was a death process. I really didn't want that at all. But it's actually a really very, very beautiful thing to have happened to me. Because I hope most of the time in the right way, I really don't mind anymore what people think of me. <laughs> Sometimes I should mind a little bit more when they say, um, Martin, you need to remember to do this. Leslie tells me, you've got to remember to bring the cheque for the last funeral, Martin, into my office. Yes, that's need to be successfully remembering that. But there are many other ways in which it's actually a beautiful place to come to when you don't... It's not that you don't care anymore, but it doesn't matter anymore. So if you get an arrow coming in your back, it doesn't matter because I've already died. <laughs> I've already died. The seed's already gone in the ground and died. There's nothing left to die. When you get to this place, and I haven't really fully got there yet, but at least I recognize when, when um, what's going on, when it's happening. I say, oh, yes, I rec recognize what's happening here. Um, you know, uh, then you spot the, the thing quickly and you... you, you um, but when you get to this beautiful place that you have died, I think Nicodemus, we had two weeks ago, didn't we? Remember Nicodemus? 
I think he was searching to get to this place. And Jesus said, you've got to go back into your mother's womb and die all over again if you want to see the kingdom of God. I think that's what uh, he was searching for. When you get to this beautiful place of having died to your own pride, your own reputation, you, are, you become indestructible. And then, actually, truly free. Truly free. No longer victim, no, uh, no longer captive to what others might be saying. Truly, if you like, eccentric. Loopy in the eyes of the world. Just imagine for a moment uh, the old way, the first way, living for yourself, and imagine the oldest son of Jesse, Eliab, tall, handsome, gifted, erudite, on the surface a great king in the making, but passed over by Prophet Samuel for this little young upstart, the shepherd boy David. This Eliab, still trapped in the old way, I kind of imagine him, <gasps> what? Why are they choosing him, the little shepherd boy, over me? Eliab needed to be humbled, broken, before God would be able to use him. I'm reading something into this. So, as Paul says in his epistles, whether in good repute or ill repute, in fame or or in fame or dishonor or honor, whatever, um, you're still living on the rock that is Christ. So here are the two houses Jesus referred to is in, in his parable at the end of uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 7. There's the house built on sand and the house built on rock, isn't there? And the house built on sand is the house, house built on your own reputation. What other people think of you, Yeah. We all know what happens to the house built on sand. The storms come along, the wind blows, and the house collapses because it's built on sand, on a false premise. But the house built upon rock is the house built on the house of, of the rock of Christ, which I believe that um, was the theme of last week's sermon from Charles. Was it not, Charles? Yeah. Yes. The house built on the, on the rock of Christ, when is built on the foundation of Jesus and him alone, when the storms come and the wind blows, the house stands. Now, one final thought. We started the service with Philippians 2, didn't we? Yeah? Do you remember that? That wonderful Christ hymn. And there, it, 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 Paul says, um, he made himself, Jesus made himself, of, uh, made himself as nothing dying on a cross, becoming obedient to God and be dying on a cross. He made himself as nothing. Yeah? Uh, the underlying Greek word is he emptied himself. It's a kenosis. He emptied himself. Another translation, that famous King James translation, says he made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. Jesus chose to... Throw away any reputation he might have. Yeah? Doing the loopy thing, becoming obedient to his father, obeying his will to go to the cross and die. And because Jesus made himself of no reputation, was willing to obey his, cr his father's crazy command to go to the cross, he went to the cross and therefore, God has exalted him and raised him up that whoever believes in him might not die. God has raised him up, the crucified one, so that every tongue might confess that he is Lord and every knee bend before him to the praise and the honor of God, who is Father, the Lord. So do you see, we have this Perfect example. Jesus, he didn't mind what the religious leaders of his day thought of him. He was completely impervious to all their criticisms. He was truly free. Truly free. 
It only mattered to him what his father thought of him, whether his, he was fulfilling his will, the will of the father. That took him on a journey to death. But he's my role model, he's our role model, and as we walk in his footsteps, God advances his kingdom. For these are the deep, hidden secrets of the kingdom that are mine and yours. This is our inheritance. How precious is that? May we pray now. Do we have somebody to lead us in prayer? Thank you very much, Jackie.